Good afternoon. Welcome to The Exiles. Glad to have you with us. Coming to you live from Bayou Smokehouse, the best barbecue in Baton Rouge, 10655 Corsi Boulevard. Those of you who are watching us uh, in other areas, next time you're in Baton Rouge, lunch or dinner, visit them. They're terrific, terrific food. For the OZU in Baton Rouge, we have a rare kind of a slack lunch crowd because I think of the weather, the rain. So you will not have to wait for a table or for that great friendly service if you want to come by and grab some mouth-watering barbecue. They do it all right here. We're going to have a lot on the show today, including a visit with East Baton Rouge Parish EMS in just a little bit. But in the meantime, uh, it's gotten to the point where we almost have to keep a box score of violent crime in East Baton Rouge Parish. Now, they do a better job of helping us with the box score. Those of you in New Orleans and Orleans Parish and New Jefferson Parish, you guys put out the press releases right away. Sometimes it takes us a little longer to process here in Baton Rouge. All right, between 9 p.m. last night and 7 a.m. this morning, are you ready? An armed robbery of a business on Florida Boulevard. No shots were fired. An overdose, overdose death at a hotel on Gwenadale. All right. a, lot of you, a lot of you say see these crime reports that come out of Gwenadale. That's that area at I-12 and Sherwood Forest where they've got about five or six hotels clustered. It seems to have become a real hot spot for mayhem, death, and violence. Gunshot on Curtis Street not expected to survive. Victim is not expected to survive. On 38th Street and Chippewa, someone shot to death. That one we know didn't survive. A shooting on Elgin Street. Victim was hit four times, two different caliber weapons, a 5.56, which is a rifle round, and a nine millimeter. A body found on the road on Gus Young and 44th Street, stabbed to death. They were alive momentarily, but they coded on the scene and did not make it. <sighs> God, how I wish we had something else to talk about in East Baton Rouge Parish. But I'm afraid we don't. Now, something we were talking about off the air before I came on is... Uh, this incident in Zachary, a very, very, very strange incident in Zachary. 17-year-old puts a ladder up next to a house in the overnight hours, climbs the ladder, and goes into a 14-year-old's bedroom. Now, they knew each other. It wasn't an attempted abduction or anything like that. It was a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that the dad was not real, real thrilled about, okay? He had tried in the past to keep them apart. Well, dad apparently heard something going on near his daughter's bedroom. Dad is Desmond Cage, age 84, uh, 84 34, excuse me. The 17-year-old, Nicholas McWhorter. Well, dad goes up and says, son, we need to have a talk. And he escorts him downstairs. Now, I'm guessing that he didn't escort him downstairs in the most gentle of fashion, okay? Been trying to keep you away from my daughter for a couple years and you are going to stay away from my daughter and you're damn sure not going to sneak into my house in the middle of the night to see my 14 year old daughter well what dad didn't know is that Nicholas McWhorter had a stolen firearm on him and he and dad got into a gun battle in that house dad is dead. The 17-year-old has been booked into juvenile detention. Or excuse me, no, the parish prison. Second-degree murder, 
unlawful entry, possession of an illegal firearm. Now, this is bad enough on the face of it. But there are people who believe that 17-year-old Nicholas McWhorter is going to get away with it. I heard somebody just say it not more than five minutes ago. There are some people who think that because the daughter invited him in, now she didn't take him in through the front door, she let him in through a window, that that makes him not a trespasser. And while Dad can't tell his side of the story because he is dead at the hands of Nicholas McWhorter, there are people that are thinking right now, thinking out loud, that the charges are going to get reduced. By the way, I'm not one of them. I don't think the charges are going to get reduced. I think this kid is going to go away for a long, long time. And since he's 17 years of age, he can be sentenced to, to life imprisonment for second-degree murder. Now, he does get an automatic appeal on that sentence because he is 17. He's right on the, on the cusp of where you can actually sentence somebody to life if they commit a murder. But I don't believe... I don't believe that he's going to get off. I don't believe that they are going to reduce the charges. As soon as he gets out of the hospital, he's going to be booked on second degree murder, illegal use of a weapon, and illegal possession of a stolen firearm. What do you think? Is our system this messed up? That this guy who guns down a man in his own home after sneaking in through the window to see the underage daughter whom he's been forbidden from seeing at least twice in the past by the father. You think he's going to walk? I don't believe our system's that messed up yet. So I don't think he is going to walk. But we certainly will see, won't we? Back with, back with uh, more in a minute on Exiles TV. Please stick around. I owed the IRS $10,000. The IRS garnished my wages. They put a lien on my house. I'm self-employed and didn't report all my income. They claim I owe a lot more than I do. The IRS is the most powerful collection agency in the world. They do not give up until you pay. I couldn't sleep. We were being audited. I called Tax Solutions Now and a great big weight was lifted off my shoulders. I called Tax Solutions Now and they got the IRS off my back. Tax Solutions Now had my wage garnishment lifted in 48 hours. Tax Solutions Now can get you help. Help. Our agents know the rules, can stop the pain, and get you the best deal. Tax Solutions Now saved my business. I qualified for the Fresh Start program. I paid less than I owed. We connect you with a team of former IRS agents and tax professionals who get the IRS off your back. Time is running out. Call Tax Solutions Now. Call 800-778-4345. 800-778-4345. Hi, I'm Bobby Yarborough with Manda Fine Meats. Here at Manda, we know what the folks of South Louisiana love. They love great flavored smoked sausage, delicious deli meats, and specialty items like boudin and andouille sausage. Manda Fine Meats has been providing these products since 1947. We produce them right here in Baton Rouge, so you know you're always getting the freshest product at your local grocery store. Manda Fine Meats. Taste the fresh local flavor in everything we make. Make it Manda every time. No one can stop me when I taste the feeling Nothing could ever bring me down Nothing could ever bring me down Taste the feeling
Welcome back to Exile TV. Glad to have you with us. Uh, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but this terrible wet weather pattern all the way from Lake Charles, all the way through the New Orleans area, into the Florida parishes, into the river parishes, is going to continue at least until Saturday. Uh, we have had in Baton Rouge a couple of those extremely violent bullseye thunderstorms in the last 24 hours. And I know you folks in Lafayette, in Opelousas, uh, in Jennings, uh, down in Homa, Morgan City, you have had them too. I don't think the New Orleans area has had these real violent ones since Sunday night was the last one there. But this weather pattern is continuing through Saturday morning. And I, I don't know what we can do anything about it. I don't know how we can do anything about it. Uh, one more one more thing on uh, on my favorite topic, and that is the juvenile justice system. If you remember, just two weeks ago or so, we were talking about a person who was found shot to death in their car on Tiger Brand Road, not too far from where we shoot this television show, maybe about three, four miles as the crow flies. Now, the Sheriff's Department has announced that they have made an arrest in what turned out to be a murder. They have arrested a 16-year-old. They believe that the victim, 20-year-old Kishun Thomas, was part of a drug operation. They put the 16-year-old with him based on Kishun Thomas's damaged cell phone, which was found near the scene, but not on his body because the 16-year-old admitted he tried to destroy the phone and get rid of it so he wouldn't be linked to the victim. The teen is going to be booked for first-degree murder, armed robbery, and obstruction. That's because he tried to break up the cell phone, but he didn't do a real good job of it. And the teenager, according to the sheriff's department, has admitted that he was meeting the victim for a drug deal, but he said he shot the victim, robbed him, and stole his cell phone. He then went, uh-oh, and tried to destroy the phone to avoid being linked to the killing. When the deputies executed a search warrant at the teenager's home, they seized drugs, more guns, and cash. So apparently this 16-year-old has been an operator for quite some time. I know you know what I'm going to say next, but I have got to say this. We, who live within arm's reach of this guy, this killer, this guy who isn't even a trustworthy criminal, yeah, we're going we're gonna to set up, we're going to meet, I'm going to buy some drugs, I'll move them for you, I'll give you money, you give me the drugs. He can't even be trusted not to bust a cap in the guy who's his supplier. He's not even a good criminal. But we, who are now paying for his food, paying for the pillow that is under his head, paying for the blanket that is covering him, and probably paying for the public defender that will defend him. We cannot even know who he is. We cannot even know where he was living, where they seized drugs, more guns, and cash. Why? Because he is 16 years of age. And juvenile criminals in this state are shielded. Now, we are not shielded from these criminals. And we are not even allowed to know who they are. I have a serious problem with this. If there is one thing that is somewhat effective and it's more effective than movie night, more, more effective than free ice cream, more effective than night basketball. If there is one thing that's affected 
in the community where so much of this crime is happening, it's that, that these young thugs are afraid not of the police, they're not afraid of jail, they're afraid of mama, and they're afraid of grandma. And mama and grandma tell these kids day in and day out, don't you bring shame on me, don't you bring shame on my house, don't you dare do that. But because they will not release the name of a 16-year-old who committed a big boy crime, killed somebody with a gun that's stolen, we're not allowed to know his name. We're not allowed to know where they picked up the drugs and the guns and the cash. In other words, where he lays his head. And what happens there, and I'm sorry, Mom, and I'm sorry, Grandma, and I'm sorry for all of you, is that you don't get to share in the shame that he did bring down on your family. And that deterrent isn't there. Oh, and by the way, there are good, honest people that deserve to know that they might have been living next door to an armed teenage drug dealer. They deserve to know that their kids might have been playing ball with an armed teenage drug dealer. But we don't get to know that because they're shielded by the juvenile justice system. Now our legislature is going to meet today in a veto session. First time ever. Veto override session is happening starting today. First time ever. Maybe when they're done with this and they come back for their next legislative session, we can find some legislators that have some cojones and get them to sponsor legislation that takes away the shield for juvenile criminals charged with violent crimes. I don't think that's too much to ask. If you don't think it's too much to ask, start talking to your state senator or your state representative now and see if we can get something done about violent, barbaric criminals who get the shield of anonymity gracefully granted by the citizens of Louisiana. It ain't right. It simply ain't right. More to come next on Exiles TV. Stick around. All right, bro. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. Hi, I'm Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Siller with The Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And Talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. This is State Treasurer John Schroeder urging you to check your mailbox. We just mailed out four and a half million dollars of unclaimed property checks to people across Louisiana. Unclaimed property is lost money turned over to the Department of Treasury so we can return it to you. The process is so easy, you can claim it right from your phone. Check for yourself, check for your family, and don't forget to check your businesses. This is your money, claim it. Check your mailbox. And cash your check, it's that easy. You're invited to the Bridal Show of the Future, a new twist on the typical Bridal Expo. Come out to experience the food, dancing, meet and greet, wedding event professionals, and win fantastic prizes. Friday, August 6th from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. To purchase tickets, please visit thepostbridalshowgonzales.com or follow on Instagram. All proceeds benefiting the VFW Post 3693 of Gonzales supports your local veterans. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugge, Jr., and I am a general dentist at Frugge Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we give back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family. Go where summer leads you in an award-winning Mazda CUV. Find yours during Mazda's season of discovery. Call, click, or come by and discover your new Mazda today at Baton Rouge's Mazda dealer. Team Mazda on airline. Back to Exiles TV. Glad to have you along with us. I'm Bill Perfetti. Kevin Gallagher uh, still taking a little time off, recuperating from his cancer treatments. I expect to see him back here fairly shortly. Joining us today, uh, Lieutenant uh, Brad Harris with East Baton Rouge Parish EMS. Uh, and you guys have been very, very busy. I've, I've been seeing and a lot of lights and sirens uh, over the last month or two since you've been here. Uh, we've had summer uh, accidents. We've had uh, uh, the usual plethora of, uh, of building fires and things like that. We also have, uh, uh, I want to start with the street crime where you're actually able to get these people to where they can be saved. Right. We have been hearing that our murder rate would be much higher were it not for the high quality of our emergency medical service and our level one trauma centers. What's it been like for East Baton Rouge Parish EMS uh, on the streets with, with intentional woundings yeah uh, so yeah our call volume has risen uh, these trauma calls that we keep getting these shootings stabbings uh, just general assaults um, are going up it seems uh, you know we we pride ourselves in getting on the scene quickly and getting off the scene you know within a relative uh, you know 10 minutes roughly amount of time and then we can get them to the hospital a lot of our procedures uh, that we do on scene do help save lives um, we're able to uh, stop the bleeding as soon as possible, um, give them fluids, give them medicine, that sort of thing to, to keep them alive, to get to the hospital and have surgery. Let's talk about, uh, uh, about the critical time um, and, and talk about the, uh, that you also have a little bit of help now. Uh, BRPD, usually the first ones on the scene. I don't know about the sheriff, but I assume that if they don't, they will. They've now got these kind of shock trauma bags that they carry with them. Yeah, so they'll have tourniquets in it, blood stoppers, that sort of thing, chest seals. Um, so all of those things um, in combination, uh, you know, if you can get there and put a tourniquet on and it might take us another couple minutes to get there, um, that's two minutes or so of, of blood loss that you're, you're mitigating. And you also have uh, St. George now has two sprinter units out that have paramedics in them because sometimes they are located closer to an event outside the city limits than one of your stations is yeah uh it just depends on you know the the time of day when the call comes out where our units located at that at that moment uh st george does have the sprinter units with paramedics on them the, they're able to do all the same things that we can do in an ambulance um maybe perhaps get there sooner than us or about the same time and just giving us a, a helping hand but you know as they have said uh, uh they are there to be uh, a cooperative help to EMS because they do not transport right no transports um, they'll show up uh, sometimes first they'll get there and uh, if they decide that they don't need us to transport then they'll cancel our unit which is good for us uh, that spares another unit on the street for us to uh, have available for another emergency so as, as we look at what is coming we are we are going to have a full sports season yeah <laughs> Uh, in a matter of, what, five weeks? Yeah, just a month or so, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have a full sports season. Uh, that means people who slip on the stairs in stadiums. Mm -hmm. That means people who have heart attacks. 
That means people who have car accidents going to and from. People yep. get hit by cars. That seems to be becoming a very big thing. And the first couple games is usually still hot, so we have a lot of heat-related emergencies out there. We're already preparing for it. Um, we're already starting to schedule our medics out there. Um, you know, in years past, you know, last year we didn't really have a season, but you know, in years past, typically we have a, a med trailer set up uh, for rehab, and then we have a couple ambulances. We have our little carts that go out. We have bike teams. Uh, so we're, we're prepared for an emergency that comes out. How does that stretch you, though, as far as covering a whole parish? Uh, it doesn't because we use overtime. So we'll, we'll pay our medics overtime. So that's medics that are off already that day. They would volunteer to work that event. So um, it doesn't take away from the street. <clears throat> One of the other things we are seeing is the Delta variant appears to be extremely contagious. Yeah. And we are seeing lots and lots of people getting sick again, many of them younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard, I believe, it was uh, Our Lady of the Lake, uh, Dr. Catherine O'Neill. Mm -hmm. And this was a couple of days ago, and she said in hospitals in Louisiana, we have something like 780 people that are in ICU care for COVID Delta variant, right. all of them had not been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. She also said that we are not having any vaccine related side effects or reactions that are causing hospitalization. So what, I, what I'm getting to is I'm guessing that until this gets tamped down, you all are gonna be back in the business of transporting COVID patients. Yeah, we see them on a regular basis. Um, every day we have you know a few calls come in. Um, I think a lot of people though that, that have it or are sick from the COVID, um, we did a big PR campaign last year about not calling 911, only you know call your doctor, self-isolate. Um, you don't necessarily have to go to the hospital just because you have COVID. Um, obviously, you know if you have severe symptoms of difficulty breathing, uh, you're so weak, you're confused, you're dizzy, lightheaded, you know, call us for that. But um, if it's just, you know, oh, I, I have a positive COVID test, I think I need to go to the hospital. Um, that's not necessarily a reason to call an ambulance. It's not an emergency. It's not an emergency. Um, and outside of COVID, I mean, just non, non emergent calls in general tie our system up. Uh, people call us for everything under the sun. I mean, you know from firsthand experience, uh, we get called out all the time just to check people. And, you know, we don't mind doing it. However, it does take away, we have a finite amount of resources. So, you know, if we have 16 ambulances in the parish and 10 of them are tied up on calls that are non emergent, uh, and then someone's having a heart attack somewhere, that unit's gonna have to come from farther away. We might not have a unit to send, so we have to hold it for a little while. Uh, we do try to prioritize calls, um, you know, triage them. So if it is a non-emergent call, we typically hold that uh, in lieu of, you know, more emergent calls. But um, yeah, the COVID calls, they come out every day. Um, we treat them just like we did, you know, prior. Uh, nothing new because of the Delta variant. Um, the research that I've read says that the vaccines that they have currently do vaccinate against the Delta. Um, the only major difference I can tell is that it's just more contagious. Yeah, I, I, I'm troubled by the young people who we thought if they got COVID in some sort of form, it was going to be so mild that they might not even notice. Yeah. But now a lot of these 17 year olds, 16 year olds are getting very, very ill mm -hmm. and to the point of you know, you're worried whether or not they're going to make it. Uh, right. uh, the, the reports coming from ICUs all over the country saying, this is not like the COVID we had a year ago. Yeah. This is something completely different in terms of how, how virulent it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's more contagious for sure. That's what I've, I've read about. Um, so the symptoms are typically the same though, as far as I understand. Um, the children typically, uh, have a better outcome just because they're younger their bodies can fight off the infection better their immune systems are better than ours <laughs> exactly um so you know typically you have a child that has covid um they they are able to to make make it through one of the things that and we've kind of lost sight of this in fact uh, dr bo clark is going to be sitting where you're sitting on thursday to talk about this because we're worried about the trauma that we have going on in terms of crime trauma. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing an awful lot 
of car versus pedestrian accidents yeah. and a lot of high-speed automobile accidents. We, we kind of look at that, but what we're not seeing is that our opioid overdose numbers are through the roof, unlike anything we've ever seen. Yeah, they are. Are y'all getting a lot of calls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. Uh, we actually just ran the numbers uh, for the advocate. They had, they were doing a story on it, and uh, we ran the numbers from up to this point last year versus now. And, and I want to say it was like 200 more patients this year than last year. Uh, up to this point, I think we had like 800 and something overdoses, um, which is substantial. I mean, that's you're looking at 10 a day at least. And that and that's not deaths that's all overdoses because yeah. i would imagine if you're called in a timely fashion you can save them probably what 90 90 percent of them yeah that's that's probably a good number uh, the narcan now that's available over the counter um, we get calls like that all the time it's someone that abuses you know narcotics maybe their family member knows it so they went ahead and they got some narcan they gave it, but the thing is about Narcan is it's got a really fast um, activation, but the half-life's not very long. So they give it, the person wakes up, the family member says, okay, they're good, and then a half hour later, the patient's going back unresponsive. That's when we get called. Um, as long as we get called and we were there, um, you know, before they deteriorate too far, we were able to save them. Now, again, it, you know, we learn as we get more experience. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people out there that figure that Narcan's a one-shot deal, but it's not. Are, are you telling me that if it's if it's something really heavy duty like fentanyl, you might have to give them twice or three yeah, times? Yeah, you might have to give multiple doses of the um, of the Narcan. And then too, you have to watch out for when the patient does become responsive again. Uh, they might have an altered consciousness, they might be combative. Uh, they might start to vomit, things like that because you kind of have these uh, withdrawal kind of symptoms. So you always you know, tell people, you know, if you're gonna wake someone up with Narcan, just be prepared for if they start to vomit, if they start to be combative with you, that sort of thing. But you're, you're also, you're not saying, wait for us. If you've got it, <laughs> right. give it. Yeah, if you have it, give it, obviously. Uh, if, if they're unresponsive and they're having trouble breathing and you know that they have taken a narcotic, the Narcan can help. It only works on narcotics though, opioids. It does not work on like benzodiazepines, like a Valium or a Xanax. It wouldn't work on that. Yeah. Um, but it does work for the fentanyl, the morphines, the oxycodones, that sort of thing. Does it work on, on, the, on the analogs as well? The fentanyl that isn't real fentanyl, but you know, is, is close I, in, in composition? I'm not sure exactly. Uh, you had to have to look into that. But um, you know, normally what we'll do is if we have an unresponsive patient, their pupils are pinpoint, we know that they've taken something, we'll give the Narcan. Uh, sometimes it takes multiple doses. And then, too, they might need some respiratory therapy. They might need some IV fluids and that sort of thing as well. Well, I mean, you, you basically you kind of have to run the whole drill. Yeah, you run the whole drill. And, you know, like you were saying, the analogs, I mean, you don't know what you're getting in some of those, those medications. You know, you know I, we need to take a break, but I want to talk about that, uh, okay. uh, about what's out on the street now, you know, whether it's, it's coming from grandma's medicine cabinet or whether it's being manufactured. I've, I've heard that, that a lot of these clever drug dealers have got pill stamps, and, and they stamp them with the same code as a prescription you would get. But I want, I want to see what you all are seeing out right. there, since you're the one who's, when they're on the floor, giving them the Narcan. We'll be back with Brad Harris from East Baton Rouge EMS in just a moment on Exiles TV. Bolello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent. Depend on us for service, for selection, for price. Get huge Whirlpool savings. Shop now and save on Whirlpool appliances throughout the store. Plus, experience our price match guarantee and ask about special financing. You can depend on the know-how of people who live appliances every day. Bolello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent with nationwide buying power. Hello guys, it's Debbie. It's time. I've got a brand new location. 10510 Airline Highway, Baton Rouge, next to After Five Tuxedos. We have the perfect spot to get all your wedding and formal wear needs. Come see our one-of-a-kind name brand and get great prices. With 30 years experience, the best customer service anywhere. It's Debbie's Bridal, Airline Highway, Baton Rouge. See you soon. 
I am Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Siller with The Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. This is State Treasurer John Schroeder urging you to check your mailbox. We just mailed out four and a half million dollars of unclaimed property checks to people across Louisiana. Unclaimed property is lost money turned over to the Department of Treasury so we can return it to you. The process is so easy, you can claim it right from your phone. Check for yourself, check for your family, and don't forget to check your businesses. This is your money, claim it. Check your mailbox and cash your check, it's that easy. Sometimes life is wonderful, and sometimes it's not. Cherish the good, but always be prepared for life's challenges. At Private Healthcare, we provide the peace of mind you deserve. With Private Healthcare, you'll get the coverage you want and healthcare you need. If your employer doesn't supply healthcare coverage and you don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid, you need to give us a call right now. Private health care is private health insurance for ages 65 and under with medical, dental, vision, and even prescription coverage. When life comes at you unexpectedly, you need to be ready. And health insurance is your financial safety net. Health insurance has never been so easy and affordable. If you're looking for health coverage at the best price and your annual household income is $35,000 or more, call the number on the screen now and speak with a live health care consultant. Don't wait. Get the coverage you need now. TV. Glad to have you with us. If you are not getting rained on right now, anywhere where you can see this television program, you're about to get it. Wait for it. You're about to get it. The storm system is huge. It goes all the way from the Texas border to the Mississippi border, both north and east. We're going to have to deal with this until Saturday. And then Saturday, we get a little bit of a break, hopefully. But uh, stay dry and stay careful out there, particularly if you're driving in this stuff. Uh, with me, uh, continuing, is, is uh, Lieutenant Brad Harris with East Baton Rouge EMS. We're talking about the opioid crisis that we have all over this country. And, uh, and I want to know what kind of things you're seeing on the street. What, uh, is it still a lot of prescription medicine that's been stolen or overprescribed, or are we getting some homebrew out there? Yeah, it's a lot of manufactured uh, drugs, narcotics that we're seeing. Uh, it's on a powder form or in a pill form. Uh, they'll crush it up. They'll either uh, snort it or they'll, you know, take the pill or they'll shoot it up. Um, you know, and it's, what's funny is, you know, people actually still try to drive. I mean, we find people passed out in cars all the time and they'll still have the needle in their arm or um, they'll have, you know, the white powder in the bag and the little in the cup holder and that Jeez. sort of thing. And uh, we have to be careful as responders because, you know, it's so potent. If you touch it and you get it on your skin, it can actually absorb in. Um, you know, I've heard of police officers that we've had to go evaluate because they, they got in contact with it. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's very potent. The, the fentanyl that's coming out is uh, 100 times, you know, more potent than morphine. So, uh, I mean, you could take the medication and... I mean, before long, you're just, you're unresponsive. It lowers your respiratory rate, so you stop breathing. Uh, that's what we come in, and we have to help you breathe. We have to give you the Narcan to reverse the effects of it. Uh, so it's, it's crazy. I mean, it, we, we see it at overdoses all the time. The, you know, we see this in TV and the movies where the, the cops have the little test kit. They've arrested somebody, this little vial, and they put some of the powder in usually, and they shake it up, and it turns a color you don't have time for that in the field. Not EMS. We don't. No. Uh, police, I guess, do, but we don't. We don't do that. Uh, we we like to find out what the medication is that they took, if we can, uh, or the police will have to, you know, tell the hospital later what they found, or the hospital will have to do blood tests to find out exactly what's in their system, uh, and, and go about that way. Um, we were talking during a break about the the bath salts that they had. Uh, that was Mojo. a couple, couple yeah. years ago. Mojo was big. Uh, we don't see that too much anymore. But the problem with the Mojo was they would make, they, people thought it was legal. I mean, even a lot of the stores around here would sell it. Yeah. And 
you know, we would find people in their car, passed out, and they got this little cigarette that's, you know, got the mojo in it. And um, so that's something that we're not seeing too much anymore. It's, it's mostly just the narcotic overdoses. Do, is there a street use for fentanyl where you actually perhaps would, you know, uh, soak uh, a marijuana cigarette in the fentanyl and take it in that way and perhaps have a consequence that you are not anticipating? I can't think of any reason why you would have to do that or want to do that, but um, I can imagine smoking it would probably be detrimental. Um, it would probably hit your, hit your lungs and get into your system a lot faster than if you took it as a pill form. Well, and again, it, what people are buying out in the street, and as I understand it, it's cheaper to buy heroin, which is probably cut with fentanyl, than it is to buy marijuana now, <laughs> from, from what I understand. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, this is what it's cops. Are, this is what cops are telling me. Yeah. You know, uh, but you don't know what you're getting. Right. You don't know what you're getting. People cut it with because um, they want to make a profit. Yeah. So they'll get a little bit of heroin. They mix it with some, you know, uh, I don't know, calcium powder or something like that to to make it more. So that way they can, you know, sell more of it. Um, but you don't know what they're mixing it with. It might be calcium powder or it might be, you know, rat poison. Yeah. You, you don't know what it is. And uh, a lot of times we don't even know what we're dealing with. We just see an unresponsive person, we wake them up, we'll ask them, what did you take? And a lot of times what the answer is, I don't know. They just take something, I don't know what it is. Well, at least it's progressed. <laughs> when, when, I, when I did that in the Stone Age, we'd say, what'd you take? I need to know. I didn't take anything. Yeah, Come we, on, I knew you'd take something. We still get that too. Oh, right? really? Well, yeah, we, we get that all the time. It's, you know, We'll wake him up with the Narcan. What did you take? Oh, I'm not on, I didn't take anything. Well, the Narcan wouldn't have worked if you weren't on something. Mm -hmm. So obviously you're on something. And, um, you know, a lot of times they're scared because the police are there, but, you know, in the ambulance, I don't care. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. I just want to know which you're on so that we could tell the hospital. Well, and, and it, it's not morbid curiosity. There are drug interactions. Yeah. You could possibly administer somebody, and if, they have, if they're still loaded with an opiate, mm -hmm. you could hurt them yeah. rather than helping. And it's not just the opiates, it's other medications. Um, I mean, I don't know if you, you probably know about this, but uh, men that take Viagra and they're on nitros, nitro paste or uh, nitro spray for heart problems, mm -hmm. uh, that can have an interaction. It can lower your blood pressure. Um, you know, there's lots of different beta blocking medications that you might take or something like that. So um, we just need to know what it is. Well, there's that famous scene with uh, Jack Nicholson in the emergency <laughs> room when he's dating the much younger girl. And oh, yeah. the doctor says, are you taking Viagra? Why, no. Is it, tell me if you are, because this could kill you. Exactly. <laughs> oh, well, yes, I am. Yeah, yeah they can. So there's, there's just lots of things that we need to know. Uh, we're not ask, asking because we're just curious if you're taking it. We, we really need to know those things. I, I know that what Hiller Moore says and what the cops say and, and what Bo Clark is going to say Thursday, but this is not getting better, is it? That's not. Uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing an uptick in it. Um, I don't know what the reason is. I guess you can blame COVID. People are depressed and they're out of work and they're looking for a high, I guess. But um, I don't know. I don't know what's what's causing it, but we are seeing a lot more of it. But you know, if, if they're truly addicts, you know, and, and there are a lot of people that came by their addiction, unfortunately, honestly, they had a very painful surgery with yep. a painful recovery and they were given properly prescribed opiates and they became dependent. During COVID, when everybody was locked down, it was very, very hard to get your drugs because there wasn't much normal coming and going going on during COVID. Right. So one would think that that would have led to less opioid less use, <laughs> uh, use afterward. Right. But, but it's spiking like crazy. It is. Uh, again, I don't have the reason for it. I just know that we're going on a lot more. Um, but you're right. I mean, there, there are good people out there that got hooked on pain meds because of a surgery or something like that and once their prescription runs out and the doctor won't refill it anymore they go to the street mm -hmm. to get their high and uh, that's very very unfortunate but that is the case well you know uh, a very very good physician that we used to interview on the radio all the time 
uh, Kurt Chastain, a long-standing physician here in town, and he said, you know, the reason that doctors give opiates is because they work. Yeah. They, and you're a surgeon, and he's not a surgeon, he's an internist, but he said, you're a surgeon, you know, you've just done a very, very painful surgery, you've got your patient, you know that being in pain is not good to rec for recovery, mm -hmm. you're gonna give them the medicine that works. He said, the, 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 the trouble is that you are then forced to make a decision as to when it's too much and when it's not enough. Yeah. You know, and you're only going off of what the patient's telling you. If they're telling you you're in, they're in pain, I mean, I, I can't say one way or the other if you are. I mean, we'll look at your, your vital signs. If your heart rate's up or you're, you're sweating or your blood pressure's high, then those are kind of symptoms of your, your pain that we can see. Uh, we do give pain medicine in the field. Um, so if you're in a car accident or you have a major trauma, we actually give you pain medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then we tell the doctor or the hospital how much we gave, and then they can base that on, you know, if, they, if you need more or not. Well, <clears throat> I, I think it's a very good idea that you all are able to give pain medicine in the field. Yeah. It, it's better for the patient. It's better for you being able to transport them. They have a, a better arrival at the hospital usually yeah. than if they're just screaming in pain. But do you have one of those 1 to 10 charts in the ambulance? <laughs> the faces. A, yeah. <laughs> Again, I, I, yeah. I, looked, I looked at my cardiac surgeon and I said, when was the last time somebody told you anything other than a 10? He said, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I know. We get it. We get it all the time. Or you'll have someone that you've given pain medicine to, and they're obviously under the influence. They're falling asleep, and, you know, and they're still saying, oh, it hurts so bad. I need more. And you're like, yeah, I think you're good. <laughs> but who am I to say? They could still be in pain. Well, so and, it's and that's different with everybody. Real quickly, before we wrap it up, uh, are there any growth and expansion plans for East Baton Rouge EMS uh, yes, yes. right now? Yes, yes. We are growing dramatically. So we got uh, budgeted 16 new ambulances. Um, they're going to be coming out probably in the next month or so. Uh, they're going to look totally different from our <coughs> current standard. We new, have the, the new paint red, scheme, mm -hmm. new livery. These are going to be white with uh, blue and yellow markings on them. Very cool. And uh, in order to staff these 16 new trucks, we are hiring 32 more paramedics. Uh, paramedics and EMTs both. So uh, we are doing a lot of recruiting right now, trying to get uh, more employees. So if you're interested in a job, Baton Rouge EMS is, is looking for you. Uh, is there a website, a web portal they can go to? Uh, then go to search our department. We have a link on there, or they can go to brla.gov slash jobs, and it's on there too. And when you get these 16 more rigs, uh, is that going to just swap out what you've got, or are you going to keep some of the ones you have now operating so we'll have we're gonna more use, ambulances? Yeah, we're going to use the red ones for now until they, they expend their life, and then we'll um, you know, kind of cycle them through. But you'll have a little more coverage on the streets. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a lot more coverage on the street. Well, that's good to, knew, good to know. And, and, you know, every time we have you all on, I get emails from people or, or Facebook hits, and they say, thanks for bringing EMS on and tell them that we appreciate what they do. So I'm going to pass that along well, to thank you. Thank you very much. And if you'll pass that along to everybody else. I sure will. To Mike and Nick and, and, and everybody else, uh, that uh, the folks here do appreciate everything you do, and we appreciate it when you spend some time with us. Well, thank you for having us on. appreciate you. Brad Harris, EMS. We'll be back to wrap it up in a minute. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Spiders. Premier Pest Services. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugier Jr. and I am a general dentist at Frugier Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we get back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family.
You're invited to the Bridal Show of the Future, a new twist on the typical Bridal Expo. Come out to experience the food, dancing, meet and greet, wedding event professionals, and win fantastic prizes. Friday, August 6th from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. To purchase tickets, please visit thepostbridalshowgonzalez.com or follow on Instagram. All proceeds benefiting the VFW Post 3693 of Gonzales support your local veterans. The all-new 22 Civic, now on sale at Team Honda on Segan Lane. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club, a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. Hi, business owners. Phase three. Woohoo! But do your customers know you're back? Well, that's where the Clarence Bug Show and Pelican Broadcasting can help. Right now, we've got great rates on advertising packages to help you get the word out. Shoot me an email at bugsclarence at gmail.com. Or better yet, call me up. I'd love to talk with you. 225-485-6839. Let's get together and make phase three the best it can possibly be. Got termites? Get Premier Pest. PremierPestServices.com back to Exiles TV. Glad to have you with us again. Our thanks to uh, Lieutenant Brad Harris and, uh, and uh, everybody with East Baton Rouge Parish EMS. Um, the other big news of the day is that the veto override session is underway. It started at noon and the very first thing that happened was they had protesters in the chamber. A bunch of people with signs on sheets that said protect trans youth, not to be confused with trans fat or polyunsaturated. These are, uh, these are young people who want to be allowed to play sports as the gender that they are not. Uh, this is the bill that I think will probably, almost certainly, have its veto overridden in the, in the, uh, in the session. Um, there was a bill that was passed by both houses with a fairly large majority that would prohibit men who identify as women from playing on women's high school athletic teams. The science on this is pretty clear. Even though you identify as a female, you still have male muscle bundles and male hormones running in your body, and you are stronger, you are faster than a female of your same teenage years, and there would be a horrible unfair advantage to you because biologically, you are still a male. Nobody's trying to be mean-spirited here. They're just trying to do the sensible thing and say, you cannot compete on a female team while you are still genetically a male. For the reasons that you still have male hormones coursing through your body and you're building muscle mass like any other male would. Now that bill passed the legislature, Governor John Bell Edwards vetoed it. In fact, it was his very first veto. I am also going to speculate and say that that will probably be the first veto that gets overridden in this special veto override session. Uh, one of the other bills is doing away with concealed carry permits in Louisiana that anybody who is legally entitled to possess a handgun can in fact carry it concealed. Uh, this bill was passed by the legislature, both houses, 
and it was also vetoed by John Bell. Uh, since that time, law enforcement has been bending a lot of ears about this one. Law enforcement does not want this to become law in Louisiana. They say that it's very, very dangerous to law enforcement specifically, but it's also dangerous to the general public because, as they put it, you have people that have not certified who they are to the satisfaction of the community, the state. They have not undergone proficiency training. They have not proven that they are proficient with their weapon, which is a requirement, by the way, of concealed carry in the state of Louisiana. You don't just go and take the class. You have to go and prove that you have learned the law about carrying a, a weapon, about using a weapon, and you have, to sh you have to prove that you can take it out of its holster without shooting somebody next to you or your own self in the foot, and that you can hit what you aim at. Which, by the way, I think that's the most important thing on Earth. I mean, I like to shoot. Before COVID, I'd shoot a couple hundred rounds a month. And even at the range, I'd see people that were waving that thing around like it was a milkshake and couldn't hit a bull in the ass with a banjo. That's not somebody I want next to me with a weapon. So we will see. But I think the big thing with law enforcement is you haven't proved that you understand the law of firearms or that you are proficient, and that's why they're against the override. But the transgender athletes, I'm predicting that one's going to be overridden first out of the box. In the meantime, try to stay dry out there and stay well. We will be back with Bo Clark on Thursday to talk about opioids. He is the coroner in East Baton Rouge Parish. Until then, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.